this is from Charles. Uh, this is from Charles from Houston. Rabbi Tobia, thank you for being uh, thorough and scholarly in your approach. How much better the world would be if there were more rabbis. However, I love the howevers. <laughs> However, isn't there a bit of license being taken on your part to say that the Christian Bible went back with bleach to change Isaiah 7.14 to read virgin when the much older pre-Christ Septuagint is where this translation originates? In case readers are not aware, the LXX Septuagint, the LXX Septuagint is widely regarded as the oldest and most accurate translation of Tanakh by objective scholars, especially since, their, uh, since the revelation of the Qumran scrolls, uh, scrolls support the LXX against the much newer Masoretic text. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus joins all other historians in declaring that uh, King Ptolemy gathered six Torah scholars from each of the twelve tribes, seventy-two in all, hence the name LXX, and separated them into private rooms for the purpose of individually translating Torah into Greek, and that the miraculous result being that each translation was exactly the same. This indeed is a verifiable miracle of the power of Hashem to protect and, re and preserve the accuracy of his sacred instructions Torah. And in that translation, Isaiah 714 reads, God himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. For indeed, it is, uh, it is no sign at all for a young woman to be found pregnant and to give birth to a son. May we allow the word of God to reveal itself to us? Wow, that's, that's a pretty... That's a pretty uh, in-your-face, you don't know what you're talking about, Rabbi. Let's hear your answer. Well, uh, this person, uh, in a sense, answered his own question, but may have not realized that I think the viewers um, first need to understand what, what the point that's being made. Matthew and Luke, out of the 27 books of the Christian Bible, will assert only, only those two uh, books in the Christian Bible will assert that Jesus was conceived miraculously and born in Bethlehem. But the key is the virgin part. Um, whereas Luke um, discusses Jesus being born of a virgin in his very elaborate infancy narrative, Matthew will do tip what Matthew typically does, and that is he will, in a very graphic sense, say that this is he will use what's called a fulfillment citation, which means Matthew, in specifically referring to Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, and culminating in verse 23. That's our, uh, that's our key, that's the key passage. Matthew says the fact that Jesus was conceived to a virgin, this is not an accident, this is not an arbitrary event, oh no. It was foretold in the prophet foretold that in fact, and here's verse 23, and, it says, and Matthew says, uh, behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and uh, shall bear a son, and uh, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, if you have any Christian Bible that has footnotes, cross-references, it will always cross-reference this to Isaiah 7.14. Stop for a moment. This passage does not exist. This passage was mistranslated, and it was not a mistake. It wasn't a whoops. It wasn't that whoever, whoever came up with this uh, just misapprehended what the text says. This was a deliberate mistranslation of the Jewish scriptures because the key words here, namely a virgin, is found nowhere in the Jewish scripture. There is no such passage in the Jewish scriptures. There's only one way to say a virgin Hebrew. When I say Hebrew, I'm speaking now both of Biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew, and that's betula. There is no other way to convey virginity. The key point here is virginity is conveying one thing, and that's sexual history. It has nothing to do with a person's gender or a person's age. It means that this person never slept with anyone. The word in Isaiah 7.14 is the word alma, which is the feminine version of the word elam. And this word doesn't mean a virgin. This word means a alma, means a young woman. Ha alma has the prefix, the definite article, means the young woman, the young woman. As it turns out, it is young women that have babies and not old women. 
<laughs> if it fits perfectly. If Isaiah wanted to say virgin, he knew exactly how to use the word, because the word betula appears in the book of Isaiah five times, a very popular word in Tanakh where virginity is, is very important. Isaiah doesn't use that word, and Matthew changes the book of Isaiah. He renders the word Alma as a virgin, but he takes out the definite article. The text says that the woman's already pregnant. He makes it into a future prophecy. She will conceive. Actually, his horror means she is with child. It actually says Vakaros means she will call his name Emmanuel. But Matthew can't have Mary called Jesus Emmanuel because she never does. So Matthew will change it. They will call his name Emmanuel. But I, I don't want to get into all that because I'm going to confuse you. Now, what do Christian Bibles do? So traditionally what Christian Bibles do is, here's where they abandon the Hebrew, and in Isaiah, in order to make sure that Matthew, the author of Matthew, doesn't look like a, a, a criminal, a spiritual criminal who changed, who manipulated Jewish scriptures, they have to get rid of all the fingerprints. And in order to do that is in their translations, typically, not all, but in the, the King James, and certainly going back to our Vulgate of our good friend Jerome, uh, all those translations are going to, in Isaiah, put in the word virgin so that Isaiah 7.14, the Christian Bible, will comport with Matthew 1.23. So a Christian who's looking at the Christian Bible, at his Bible, will go to Matthew 1.23 and then can go right to Isaiah 7.14 and go, oh, it's the same thing. Isaiah says virgin and Matthew says virgin. So the point is that the Christian Bibles clean it up, meaning they protect Matthew, they, in, they create a, a barrier for Matthew so that Matthew is not, um, can't be charged with, with, with textual misdeeds. I want to make a notation here, not all Christian Bibles do this. There are Christian Bibles that are more honest, and certainly modern Christian Bibles, like the New Revised Standard Version, the New English Bible, they all reject this nonsense, and they will right there smack. If you go to Isaiah 7, 14, they will admit that the word is young woman, it's not a virgin, and they translate it that way. I don't want you to think every single Christian Bible in the world does this, engages in this kind of manipulation. Some of them distance themselves from this practice, but this is the pervasive practice in almost all Christian Bibles in the world. Now, the question is, how do Christians respond to this? How do they deal with this? Because if the text in Isaiah doesn't say virgin, but it says a young woman, which with no, um, with no reference to virginity, then Matthew lied. Whoever wrote the book of Matthew changed the word of God, and therefore the book of Matthew can't be holy, and the whole Christian religion stands or falls on the credibility of the New Testament. And if the first gospel is a liar, then the whole, the whole church collapses. So, of course, Christians can't can't live this way. Now, when I say Christians, I don't mean your average Christian that you meet. These people are good people, generally speaking. It's the doctors of the church that did this. So what did they do? They changed, they changed the text. The word Alma, just to make this point further, uh, means a young woman, uh, meaning it's the feminine with the hay at the end. There's also a masculine version, an LM. And Elam is a young man. And for example, David, King David, famously, he's called an Elam, same word, just in the masculine, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56, and chapter 20, verse 22. Same word that's used there. Was David also a virgin? And how come the Christian Bibles never render 1 Samuel 17, verse 56, and 20, verse 22, as that David was a virgin? It instead calls him a lad, a, sti a strapling, whatever it is, a young man. It called him a million things. But never will call him a virgin. Why didn't they change um, 1 Samuel um, 17 and 20? The answer is because it had no Christological implications. And of course, it's ridiculous saying that David was a virgin. I just to explain this point to you, okay, now, here's where the next part gets in that at first sounds like a, an interesting point. And what Christians will, the argument Christians will make is the one that you've heard this fellow make. If I didn't give this introduction, you wouldn't understand it. What Christians will say is, well, when was the Jewish Bible first translated into a foreign language? So the answer will say is the Septuagint or in Hebrew is a Targum Shivim, that was 
essentially a translation rendered by Jews, learned Jews, some 2200, let's say 2200, 2300 years ago, where great learned men, according to this tradition that the fellow quoted, uh, they will tell you, translated the Bible into the Greek language, and strangely, if you go to Amazon and you order a Septuagint and you look it up, or it's available online because the copyright's over, it will say in Isaiah 7.14, the Greek word that will be employed there is the word parthenos, which means a virgin. So the argument is, aha, you see that the, this old translation, which according to Josephus, this is the argument, and the, to what's called the letter Aristide, but we're not going to get into that, and other sources, was really almost miraculously produced, this translation, and there they're using a word that says virgin, meaning parthenos in Greek. Now, the truth is, I don't want to go off, off the, the thing, but the word parthenos doesn't necessarily mean a virgin in Greek, particularly at that time. You could see Dina's after she was raped, was called that. But, but I want to just stay at the point. The point is this whole thing is complete nonsense. Uh, first of all, how could any translation be superior to the original? That's nonsense. That means, how could any person say that a translation is superior to an original language? If you're a lawyer, you know what the law of best evidence means. You learned that in your first year of law school. The law of best evidence is really simple. And that is that the original contract, the original document, has to be superior to any translation that's presented to a court. And the court will throw out any translation. If the original text was written in, in English, and someone brings in a Spanish translation that is, differs from the original, they say the, the, the Chinese translation is irrelevant. But what does the trans, translations are... Well, who cares what a translation says? If the Hebrew is the word of God, then the Hebrew is the word of God. It doesn't make a difference if they put in there, if an orangutan, it doesn't make a difference. The foolishness of this is that, in fact, the original Septuagint was not of Tanakh, of the Jewish scriptures, but only of the five books of Moses. And the, this questioner actually said this, but because he probably was copying and pasting it from somewhere. And that is that the original Targum Shivim, this translation from the Hebrew into Greek, put together by 72, we'll call them rabbis, the learned men, was only of the Torah, only of the five books of Moses, only the law of Moses. And if he looked again at his sources, he would see that Josephus says it was the law of Moses. The same thing is, is in the letter Aristide, where it comes from. It's only the five books of Moses. What I just said is not controversial, which means that no Christian would, scholar would argue with this. Now, the, your Sunday school teacher will all tell you this, if you're a Christian, of course. They will all just say, oh, they're according to the Septuagint. Well, why would, why would the Holy Spirit, who's whispering in Matthew's ear, why would, a, why would God be quoting from any translation? But the Septuagint was only the five books of Moses. The book of Isaiah is not a part of the five books of Moses. The book of Isaiah comes from the part of Tanakh that's the prophetic part. And therefore, the book of Isaiah, it, there was no original Septuagint. Now, later on, here's the rub where everyone gets confused. And that is that subsequently, there was a translation done, let's say 2,250 years ago, of the five books of Moses into Greek. That uh, translation was done for Ptolemy, and it was put in the library in, in Egypt. That, that, what's really today called a proto-Septuagint, was destroyed. We don't have it. If you have that Septuagint, you're a very wealthy person. No one has it. It's gone, except we have quotes from it in the Talmud and Tractate Megillah uh, 9A nine, uh, nine and B, uh, where the Talmud gives us 14 quotes from it. But it's only the five books of Moses. No one disagrees with this point. The, when, when people say virtually all scholars, when this fellow just said virtually all scholars agree with this, I don't want to be insulting, but it's just crazy, just insane. Um, no scholars believe this. This is only common. This is, only, this is like Christians believing that Jesus was born December 25th. Only, you know, that's stuff you learn in Sunday school. But no, scholar, no Christian scholar would ever stake out that claim. And most Christians would concede that, that December 25th is based on the, 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 uh, the festival in the ancient world uh, of uh, the winter solstice. So, 
No, no scholar believes this. The original is the Hebrew. And in fact, we, the whole point of, I won't say the whole, the most important uh, aspect of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the, the thing that is, there are many things that, reasons why the Dead Sea Scrolls are important to us. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it was a series of discoveries that began in 1947 when a Bedouin, named Mohammed Adib uh, through a rock and discovered these scrolls and then subsequent caves were discovered with all kinds of scrolls and fragments and so on. There are many valuable um, elements that we discovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but most importantly is that the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures that we have today, um, and all, every book except for the Book of Esther was discovered are intact. The, the Jews didn't change it. They're not corrupted. We have the Isaiah Scroll, which is on display. You could go online and see every single fragment, every single scroll online. And the Hebrew word there is Alma. It's not Betula. I encourage you to read Jerome's Introduction to Chronicles, where he says explicitly everything that I'm sharing with you. Now, what happens, this is what gets everybody in trouble. After the loss of that proto-Septuagint, the five books of Moses, so subsequently Greek translations are going to be rendered. After all, the Greek language was the lingo de Franco, was the, not quite what English is today, but in the, in the empire it was the big language. So, of course, for people who are not literate, the Bible will be rendered into Greek, and certainly it will be done for Christians. Christians are not going to, uh, Christians don't, did not read or speak Hebrew, uh, certainly by the time you get to the second and third century. Origen, however, was fluent in Hebrew. Origen was a really quite a brilliant third century, we'll call him a church father, scholar, and so on, wrote. Uh, anyways, uh, Origen was the one who would most contribute to what you find in today's Septuagint. And what they did was when producing Greek translations of the Bible, they would put the Christological words in their Greek translation, meaning to comport with Matthew, and therefore in the Isaiah 714 of the Greek translations, that's not from what those learned rabbis did, because rabbis never translated Isaiah. They only translated Genesis through Deuteronomy. These subsequent Greek translations, they put in all these Christologies to make sure that Matthew is covered. And then, the, but here is the problem. The problem is they didn't call it Origins translation. They didn't call it, this is the translation of, of Lucerne. They didn't do that. They said, this is the Septuagint. They used that original term. So the term became genericized. Every subsequent translation was called the Septuagint. And given the ascription LXX, which is 70, meaning referring to the 70 or 72 rabbis that originally translated. So all the Greek translations that would follow were given this name. And the term became, every Greek translation was called the Septuagint. Now, so, but the Septuagint, so the Septuagint that we have in our hands today is a Christian product. Everything I'm telling you, you will find in any introduction to a Septuagint you buy from any bookstore. Nothing I've sent to you is controversial. It is controversial in, in a Christian high school. It is shocking to kids because they're not taught this. But every Christian scholar, real Christian scholar, knows what I'm saying. And every introduction to the, every introduction to any Septuagint you buy on Amazon will say this in the introduction. There's nothing I'm saying, nothing I'm saying that's like Singer somehow invented this to make Christianity look bad. But translations can't be better. No matter who translates, you have the original. The original says Alma. It doesn't say Basuha. Over. In fact, we have in Proverbs very clearly, in Proverbs chapter 30, look at verse 19 and 20, you see there explicitly that we have an Alma, Derek Geva be Alma, the way of a man with a young woman, and it describes her as a complete adulteress. When she commits adultery, it leaves no sign of the fornication that she committed, just like a snake that slithers over a rock, just like an eagle that flies through the sky. After it passes through the sky, it leaves no trace, just like a ship passing through the sea. So is the adulterous woman. She washes herself, I didn't do anything wrong. So there, clearly, here's an explicit reference to the word Alma in Tanakh, written by Shleim Melch, by King Solomon of blessed memory, a great prophet. And there the word Alma is talking about someone who's an adulterous woman. So therefore, this is complete nonsense.
complete nonsense. The only credible text is the original text, the Hebrew. I don't think this person is insincere. In fact, I'm sure he's not. This is routinely taught this way. Uh, when he says um, that all scholars know this, no, 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 not at all. The original Hebrew is what's important, not translation. One other point he mentioned, I want to uh, toss out the window. He said, what kind of sign would there be if it was a young woman who conceived and had a child? Because the text says, <laughs> Behold, the Lord himself will give you sign. <laughs> Behold, the young woman is with the child. Now, his argument is, if it's just a young woman who gets pregnant and has a child, so that's natural, it happens 5,000 times every minute. There's no miracle there. What's the sign? There's no miracle. But if it's a virgin who conceives, that's a sign. Because after all, what virgin, virgins don't conceive? So again, this is a tremendous mistake, twofold mistake. Mistake is that the conception of the child is not the sign. The sign is rather the maturity of the child. If you continue, which, sorry, if you hate my guts, what are you gonna jump out the window? If you read, continue reading Isaiah 7, 14, but then go to verse 15, 16, it says, the child will be eating cream and honey when he knows to reject good and bad. For before this happens, these two kings will be destroyed. The sign is the maturity of the child, not the conception of the child. Two, a sign is not necessarily miraculous. It can be. A sign, however, must be something, think for a moment, a sign must be something that you can see. A sign is always something to see. You have a stop sign, nothing miraculous about it, but it's a sign you could see. Uh, we find in the Torah, the rainbow is a sign for a covenant that God made that will never bring another flood. There's nothing miraculous about a rainbow. Water particles in the atmosphere, light passes through it, and they become like a prism, break into colors. What's the miracle? None, but it's certainly visible. So sign is not necessarily miraculous. It can be, but it certainly doesn't. Sign doesn't mean just something you could see. And think for a moment, think. A, how could a virgin conception, no doubt, virgins conceiving, although they, there's something called parthenogenesis, but we'll just toss it out the window. Uh, let's just say that virgins conceiving, uh, conceiving children would be a miracle. Let's just say that and just throw all this ignore any scientific. Let's just say that you can't see it. Stop for a moment. I want to repeat that. If a theoretically, if a, if I concede everything to you, uh, you have a big problem. You can't see a virgin birth. That means what would it be about a virgin, a baby coming out of the womb of a virgin? How would that indicate to you that you could see it? No one could see it. The only person who knew that she was a virgin would have been Mary. You can't see it. Therefore, you could say that a virgin having a child would be miraculous, but it does not fulfill the fundamental requisite of it being something that could be visually identified. How do you identify that a virgin gives birth? If a woman is giving birth, how do you know that she's a virgin as when the baby comes out? You can't know that. So by definition, a virgin conception cannot be a sign. It could be a miracle. Now, in the pagan world, this was a very, every, all the emperors were, you know, Romulus, the fictional founder of Rome, he was conceived by a virgin and so on. Well, I don't want to get into that right now. The key point is, it, 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 number one is, the sign is not the conception, the sign is the maturity of the child. Number two is, a virgin conception would not be a sign. You can't see it. How do you see a virgin conceived? You can't see a rainbow as an example. But you cannot see a virgin birth. Who saw it? So what? What would you see? So therefore, it doesn't even fulfill. So the answer is, this is all nonsense. The Hebrew is the original, and the Greek is not the original. As it turns out, I show in my book, in volume one, that even of the five books of Moses, what you, in today's Septuagint is not the original from the original Septuagint. I demonstrate because only of well, the quotes in the Talmud, only two of them are extant in today's Septuagint. There's actually a variety of sources for the Septuagint of today, but it should not be called a Septuagint. And that term, calling today's Greek translation the Septuagint, is what fools everybody, because they think there's only one Greek translation, and that's the Septuagint done 2250 years ago, and this is complete nonsense. And then you have to ask the question, I would pose this to any thinking Christian. You must think about this for a moment. You have been taught to believe, and if I'm wrong, 
then you, I don't know what universe you come from. You've been taught to believe that the book of Matthew is a holy book, divinely inspired, and whoever wrote it, oh no, you've been taught that Matthew, a disciple, wrote it, uh, that Matthew didn't write it from his own head, but the Holy Spirit inspired him to write it. Well, why would the Holy Spirit be going to a Greek translation? Why, if Matthew was a prophet and a disciple of Jesus, and he received the oracles of his book that makes up his 28 chapter book, came from God, why would God go, hold on a moment, I forgot Hebrew, I haven't written a book in 500 years, let me look it up. That's crazy. It means why would God go, let me check, can I just check there's a translation, I want to, like, and one more point, I, I don't know, I think I ever made this. I want to say this to evangelicals, I want you to listen to me very carefully. If I asked you, why don't you believe that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God? There are many reasons that you will, be, that you will offer of why you reject the Book of Mormon. But one of them, not the foremost reason, but one of them is that the Book of Mormon verbatim quotes, I mean a 19th century book, is quoting the King James Version and specifically in the Jacobian English, which means going back to the earlier English of the 16th century, of the 17th century. And, and multiple chapters, straight King James is in the, in the Book of Mormon. And you evangelical Christians correctly and rightfully mock Mormonism for this and say, what kind of idiot would believe that the angel Moroni would convey to Joseph Smith somewhere in the United States uh, the Jewish Bible in the King James? Why would an angel be, be speaking in the King James using a Jacobian English? Why, how is that possible? That's obviously nonsense. Obviously, uh, Joseph, this whole thing is nonsense. So you're smart, and I, I don't mean this in a, in a way that is derisive. I'm sorry if it sounds that way. Obviously, it's, I, I care about you, and that's why I express this. So you, so you know that this makes no sense, that an angel Moroni would quote more than 20 chapters in the book of Isaiah alone, word for word, in the Book of Mormon, and you therefore know that the Book of Mormon can't be the, from an angel, because why would an angel from God be quoting a King James Version? And this is, you know this, you've been taught this. No, why, if you, and that's right, you're right on the money. No angel of God will be speaking in King, would be quoting a King James. Well, if you are able to use that kind of critical thinking and apply it to your rejection of Mormonism, please consider applying that same great thinking to the Septuagint. Why would God be quoting from a Greek translation? That's nonsense. God would be quoting from the Jewish scriptures as he does in the prophets, quoting from the Torah directly, not from, from uh, some Assyrian or God knows whatever translation. So that, that's all nonsensical. So it doesn't say it. The Septuagint is only the five books of Moses. The sign is, is something you could see. It's not the conception of the child. And therefore, and mo oh, no, no scholars believe this. Yes, the, the, the kid growing up in Alabama uh, believes this. They're told this. The Septuagint is never mentioned in the Christian Bible. Matthew never says that there's a quote from the Septuagint. There's no source for this in the Christian Bible. This is, but Christians will have to come up with this response because if Matthew mischaracterized what Isaiah conveyed, which he did, that means that Matthew, the book of Matthew is a, 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 a book that is completely corrupt. And then the whole credibility of the church collapses along with the book of Matthew. And this is the only way to, to rescue the book of Matthew it was by creating a fictitious translation of the book of Matthew or a corrupt translation of the book of Matthew. An original has to be superior to a translation by any means. But thank you for that question. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, B'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, B'chev Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra, V'achare, Lord, I'm not